Our second reader hails from the suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona, which is as bad as it sounds. <laughs> she packed her car with her belongings and cat and made them drive to Chicago in the miserably humid summer of 2011 and has been digging around in the Midwest ever since. She finds joy in volunteering for Chirp Radio and her day job is bringing joy to others' lives by managing a very strange local donut shop called the Donut Vault. Excuse me. <laughs> She doesn't have anything published, but blogs, tweets, Instagrams, Facebooks, snaps, tumbles, and stares off into the dark in these quiet moments waiting for sleep. Please welcome to Tuesday Funk, Jesse DeBartolomeo. Good height. I'll spring it down. Uh, you did a great job, Prince. Thank you. <laughs> One of the things I found the most intoxicating about Chicago before moving here was the deep, gritty history. I come from a part of the country where most things are torn down every 20 years and rebuilt into more parking lots, more strip malls, more restaurants. The only things that have remained continuously are the millennium old canals dug by the Hohokam tribe, which, from which the city rising from the ashes, Phoenix, got its name. I steeped myself in Wikipedia hole after Wikipedia hole during these times when my insomnia was the most intense and fulfilled my hunger for knowing my new city. Something that still holds my interest and is always included on the impromptu driving tours I give to locals and visitors alike is the old city cemetery. Back in the 1830s, not long after Chicago was incorporated as a city and North Avenue was established as the northernmost edge of Chicago, burials began in the new Chicago City Cemetery. Bodies from the two original cemeteries started by the first white settlers the, on the north sides, which included the lake shore from Chicago to Oak, and the south sides around 23rd Street, had started to be re-interned to the beautiful, newly, sur newly surveyed lands along what was then called Green Bay Road and is now Clark Street. There was a six-foot-tall white picket fence constructed to surround the cemetery to keep pigs and cows out from the north. Over the first 10 years, many plots were sold, Family vaults were erected, and acres were set aside for the Jewish and Catholic sections. Between 1850 to 1854, the population of Chicago more than doubled, and an outbreak of cholera killed thousands. This led to a huge increase in burials in the Potter's Field section of the cemetery. This plot not only included Chicago's poor, but going into the Civil War, the city began burying Confederate soldier POWs who died at Camp Douglas on the south side. The cemetery was growing along with Chicago. Some estimates place the total burials from 1860 to 1866 at over 15,000. Not only was the buried population growing, but concerns that burying bodies so close to the lake was starting to raise health concerns. Dr. John Rausch, a sanitarian mainly concerned with public health problems caused by cemeteries in large cities, suggested that the city cemetery was below the water table and posed a health threat. Some first-hand accounts even tell stories of graves slowly filling with water before caskets were lowered. This started a rural cemetery movement, which led to the creation of Rose Hill, Graceland, and Calvary, all designed with Victorian parks in mind and more than five miles north of the city's limits. The city began to urge people to move their loved ones outside of Chicago's limits so they could turn the land into a much-desired lakefront park. <laughs> President Lincoln was assassinated, and the area was renamed Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park commissioners were ready to turn the older southern portion of the land into the park grounds, but did not have the funds to cover the disinternment. They continued to develop landscaping while placing at least four ads in the Chicago Tribune telling people to come get their dead. <laughs> and then the Chicago fire happened. It burned for two days as far south as 18th and north as Fullerton and destroyed the mostly wooden markers left in the graveyard. And once the marker was gone, so was the record of who was buried there. There is still one formidable remainder of once, reminder of once once what once lay in Lincoln Park, and you can see it from LaSalle after exiting <coughs> on Lake Shore. The stately couch tome, a stone vault that took eight horses to set in place, is the final resting place of real estate ty tycoon Ira Couch and possibly three other family members. Built in 1858, it's probably one of the oldest buildings in the area to survive the fire. The several ton vault was too heavy for the city to move, so the council planted various trees and bushes and ugly barbed wire fences to obscure the mausoleum from view and pretend it never existed. <laughs> Out of what may have been up to 35,628 burials, we know for sure that 22,500 bodies were disinterred. 
These ghastly numbers lead to events like in 1998, where the remains of 81 individuals were found during the excavation for the parking lot for the Chicago History Museum. In-depth knowledge of these kinds of things make me especially fun at parties. <laughs> when, four in the clock, when four o'clock in the afternoon rolls around and I'm still at work, I find myself a little disappointed that I missed my chance to stroll through any of Chicago's historical cemeteries. This distress is not dissimilar to, say, missing the last yoga class of the day, or realizing brunch is no longer being served, or forgetting to buy those concert tickets before they're sold out. Perhaps this immersion, immersion in existentialism is a comfort to me. One of the first natural reactions I had back in June when I heard my Nana had finally passed away was to head over to Rose Hill. When I was 16 and eagerly received my license and a 97 Ford Contour, I engaged several times a week in what I've determined deemed West Coast therapy. <coughs> Gasoline, as well as my time, were much cheaper, and I spent many hours after I was done with my part-time job driving endlessly down the freeways and into the desert. One night, I finally gained the gumption to try and figure out how to climb fences, and I found myself lying on the gravel beside the stone wall where my father's ashes were interned along the side of Shaw Butte in central Phoenix. This never crossed my mind as being macabre. When I later thought about it, it felt weird and gothy, and I decided it should be kept a secret. I had watched the moon glide across the sky and listened to the coyotes and owls speaking in the distance and felt com connected to humanity. I mentioned that my first natural reaction after hearing about my Nana's passing was to go to Rose Hill. My very close second reaction was to get shit-faced at an Irish bar. <laughs> you see, my father's side of the family is half New York Italian, half Boston Irish, all Catholic, all incredibly fucking loud. <laughs> Except for my Nana. She was sweet, good-natured, and I can't recall a time where I ever saw her angry or sad. She had nothing negative to offer the world, only her laughter, her classic Boston accent. She would call a purse a pocketbook, and by pocket mo pocketbook, I mean pocketbook. <laughs> and her shining eyes, which never ceased to have an optimistic glow. Even though in her 90s she did not bear the same resemblance to her wedding photos in her 20s, you can tell she is the same woman because her eyes remain the same throughout her long life. When we lost some possession, she would tell us to pray to St. Anthony, and it always worked. <laughs> Even after I stopped attending church. She was one of those pious Catholics that never drank, but the rest of the Di Bartolomeos were a different story. If you can't already tell, I am not Italian by birth, but through adoption. The agency my parents used had information on my birth mother. She's German and Japanese. I usually told people I was German, Japanese, but Italian by osmosis, since that is the kind of family that absorbs you, like water, through semi-permeable membranes. I would usually joke about being bad news circa 1945, as my ethnic and cultural makeup was all three of the World War II Axis evil and one of <laughs> <laughs> You laugh, but the people that know me have heard this joke a million times. It's still funny to me. <laughs> my ethnic identity has always been a source of contention for me, growing up mixed race in a white family in an even larger white community that sometimes accused me of committing Pearl Harbor, or used, do you like anime, as a pickup line. About a year ago, I shelled out for a DNA test and found out that not only was I Japanese and German, but I had slivers of Scandinavian, Spanish, Polynesian, and a 13% piece of me was Irish. <laughs> and I was someone that, while loving my family, of course, had rallied against the screaming, fighting, green beer guzzling, and vomiting frat boy Irish pride image that had been cemented in my brain. I had even once caused a headache for management when working at American Apparel one year by, force, by refusing to wear green during my shift because I was so against the idea of participating in St. Patrick's. This, is, this was something I was able to tell my Nana in her dying days. I'm Irish, like you. Maybe somewhere down our Irish bloodlines, we intersected. And she, was, she would smile, I was told. And what could I do besides listen to her health updates from my family over the phone? I felt as if I couldn't touch this death. Death had been something that was very intimate for me until that point. When my father died, I was 12, and a caretaker was yanked out of my life. When my grandma on my mother's side died in my early 20s, I stood in her empty house after the family had gone through her things, and the silence was forceful and final. The I'm sorry I muttered to the vacant house echoed so loudly that it scared me, and I turned and ran out the door. Now, I was 2,000 miles away. A friend passed in the months before my Nana, but the last time I had seen him was five years ago in Phoenix. He was goofy and fun, but was usually obnoxious, bordering on offensive, a bear of a man whose sense of humor revolved around quoting TV shows. But he cared about me and always had a beer in hand waiting for me when I would walk into his house parties. 
Before I moved, he cornered the man I was moving with and did the whole big brother spiel about how he better not hurt me. I know now that he was just starting to show signs of schizophrenia and had started doing hard drugs that only aggravated his disease. He became paranoid and delusional and started threatening my friend's lives. He moved to New York with his mother and his body, weakened by drugs and mental illness, gave out at 30. But I was here in Chicago, and in my mind's eye, I could see him at some dive bar in Arizona arguing loudly with our friends about something stupid. Just like I could see my Nana in her pink and turquoise floral armchair at the house where she lived by herself, watching I Love Lucy, look up at me and smile through her Coke bottle glasses. And now I was being told that she was slipping, slipping, and then just gone. I got drunk at O'Shaughnessy's that night. It was balmy and perfect out, and I got in my car and drove around the perimeter of Rose Hill several times. It is the largest cemetery in the city. It takes almost nine minutes to traverse the entirety of the perimeter, even late at night. I cried, laughed, cried again, drove with the windows down, and engaged in that West Coast therapy. I flew to Phoenix that weekend. My cousins, who were more like extended siblings as we were all raised together in one screaming, loving mess, were always older, smarter, better, bigger, and unshakable, but this changed us. When we carried her casket through the church and to the hearse, we felt her weight as equals. We stood together in the 100 degree heat in the desert cemetery and sang Irish hymns as we lowered her into the ground. We sat together afterwards and sweated through our dress clothes and told each other to please, just please, get a keg and a handle of whiskey, dig a hole, and throw our sorry bodies in the ground when death comes for us. Thank you.